نستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل يا ايها الكافرون لا اعبد ما تعبدون ولا انتم عابدون ما اعبد ولا انا عابد ما عبدتم ولا انتم عابدون ما اعبد لكم دينكم ولي دين صدق الله العظيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي رب زدني علما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على محمد عبدك ورسولك وصل على المؤمنين والمؤمنات المسلمين والمسلمات to continue the tartib and the silsila of tafsir on wednesday inshallah for the next one or two wednesdays few wednesdays we'll be covering few the of the short surahs in the end of the quran which we generally recite it is important for us to know and understand what we recite in the Quran. Surah Al-Kafirun is one of those surahs which is regularly recited in the Quran throughout the day. So inshallah we will try to discuss the commentary and the background of the surah in very brief. We begin with the translation of the surah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the all merciful the very merciful. Qul ya ayyuhal kafirun O Prophet, say, O disbelievers, لا أعبد ما تعبدون I do not worship what you worship. I do not worship what you worship. ولا أنتم عابدون ما أعبد And you do not worship the one I worship. ولا أنا عابد ما عبدتم And I will not worship what you worship. وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا عَابُدُ And you will not worship the one I worship. لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلْيَدِينَ For you is your religion, and for me is my religion. This is the tarjuma and the translation of Surah Al-Kafirun. Surah Al-Kafirun, in the order of the Qur'an that we have now, is the 109th Surah. 109th Surah out of 114. Total, there are six verses in the surah, 27 words, 98 letters. And it is a Makki surah. The background of the surah, the Mufti Ahmed Khan, has mentioned that there are three opinions that why was this surah revealed. If you study the Quran, there's something called Shan and Nuzul, the purpose and the background and the reason for the verse or for the surah to be revealed to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So one of the opinion is that few of the disbelievers in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, remember when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was given prophethood, his mission was to invite people to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. It was that sort of zamana, it was that era where they used to worship idols, they used to worship other gods, maybe stars, fire, and he was in the middle of that. So you can imagine the atmosphere and the environment where they used to believe in different, different gods, maybe five, maybe 10, maybe 20. And in the middle of that, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi is given this task that you have to bring all of them onto worshiping only one Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, bring them onto Tawheed. So Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's begun his mission, he's begun his task, and he's inviting people to believe in one Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, inviting them towards Tawheed. Few people did accept his message, and they supported Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as much as possible. However, they did go through trouble, they went through torture. A time came where few leaders and few Disbelievers came to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said that, look, there's so much chaos and trouble inside in Makkah al-Mukarramah. Why don't we just come to an agreement where we can settle 
and we can live together in peace. So the proposal they put forward to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to compromise is that, look, for one year, we will worship you, Allah. For one year, we will worship you, Allah, with you. And for the next year, what you can do is that you can worship our idols. So in that way, we will live with harmony and we live together. So this is one opinion. Now, in response to this, this surah was revealed. The second opinion is that the disbelievers came to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they said to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that, look, stop talking ill about our idols. Stop talking against our idols. If you want wealth, we'll give you wealth so you can become the most rich person in the in Makkah and Makarrama. If you want women, we, you know, as in marriage, we can get, give you the most beautiful and the most best women that we have. Or if you want leadership, we'll make you our leader as well. But stop talking against our idols. Stop talking ill of our idols. In the response to this, the surah was revealed. And the third opinion is that they said to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi that look, okay, you don't need to worship the idols. You can continue your, your worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you come to the Kaaba Sharif. But all you need to do is that when you come to the Kaaba, just place your hands on our idols that we have out of respect. All you need to do is just place your hands on the idols or maybe just kiss, give them a little kiss. That's it. Nothing else. We don't need anything else from you. So again, in response to this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? First ayat, Qul. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is told, Qul, that in response, this is your answer. Ya ayyuhal kafirun, O disbelievers. Now in here the word al-kafirun has been used. This is referring to those disbelievers who had no thought of changing. There was no sign of them accepting the truth. So this was referring to, because they were disbelievers at that time, who later on in the future, in the, uh, in the later on in time, they did accept Islam. But there were few individuals that there was no sign of them accepting Islam at all. There was no chance of them accepting Islam. And the word kafirun is not an insulting word. It's not a word of insult, it's not a word of swear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used this word in different places as well. So it's not an insulting word. It all means, one of the meaning of that is that those who reject the truth. There's other meanings to the word al-kafirun as well. But one of them is that those who reject the truth. And if you think at that time as well, they rejected the true message from Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهُ Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi is told that, look, this is your jawab and this is your answer to the disbelievers. لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ أَعْبُدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ Now here you got four verses. They look like they've been repeated. لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ أَعْبُدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ وَلَا أَنَا أَعْبُدُ مَا أَعْبُدُونَ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ أَعْبُدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ They look like they've been repeated. Now in the first two, لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ أَعْبُدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ The tarjum and the translation given is that I do not worship what you worship. And you do not worship the one I worship. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is told by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that in the current time, in the present time, I do not worship the idols that you are worshipping and you do, not, you do not worship the Allah that I am worshipping. In the current time, I am not worshipping the idols that you are worshipping and you are not worshipping the Allah that I am worshipping. The next two set of verses, وَلَا أَنَا عَابِدُ مَا عَبَدْتُمْ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا عَبُدْ In these two sets of verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that further to this, declare to them that even in the future, even in the future, I will not worship the idols that you are worshipping and you will not worship the Allah that I am worshipping. So in the current time and in the future, this will not happen. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is told to give an answer in this way. So this, what this means is that the shirk and tawheed will not come together. Shirk, worshipping the idols and tawheed, believing in one Allah will not come together. At that time, the disbelievers used to believe in Allah. They actually used to believe in Allah. However, what their belief was that after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created everything, he distributed his matters and his tasks. He gave one an idol the task of providing children, he gave another idol the task of giving water, rain, he gave another idol the task of food. So he distributed his matters and his tasks and he doesn't need to do anymore, he just relaxes and he just sits. So they're associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is what their belief was. 
So that's why in the Quran, Allah SWT even said that, وَلَا إِسْأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ In another place, وَلَا إِسْأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَسَخَرَ الشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرِ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ That if you were to ask these people who created Allah, or sorry, who created the earth and the heavens, and who is in control of the, um, the moon and the stars, they would definitely say it's Allah. But at the same time, they would say that these matters have been distributed. So they would associate partners with Allah subhanahu Wa ta'ala. So this is what their belief was. So Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is told that give their answer that in the current time I'm not worshipping what you're worshipping and in the future I'm not going to worship what you're worshipping as well. For you is your religion, for you, for me is my religion. So this is the brief understanding of this surah. Now in here, as we mentioned that the four verses have come, it looks like it's been repeated. Now why has it been repeated, repeated? The ulama have given an answer to that. Imam Bukhari Rahmatullah in his kitab, in his kitab tafsir he says, he says that you know the first two, ولا أنا, uh, ولا أن, uh, um, the first one, ولا أنتم عابدون ما عابد, لا أعبد ما تعبدون ولا أنتم عابدون ما عابد. In the first two, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is talking about the current time, the present time, and in the last two, he's talking about the future. So this is what Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi's opinion is that the first two verse, sets of verses is talking about the current time, and the next two verses are talking about the future. Hafiz Ibn Kathir rahmatullahi alayhi, he explains. That the first two are talking about the gods that they're worshipping, that the idols they worship, and Nabi Sallallahu is worshipping one Allah. So they will not worship each other. So the disbelievers will continue worshipping the idols, and Nabi Sallallahu will continue worshipping Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala alone. And the second two verses are referring to the method of worshipping. So the first one is referring to the gods itself. And the second two verses are referring to the method of worshipping those gods. So that's why Ibn Kathir Rahmatullahi Alayhi is saying that this is the two differences. So they're not actually repeating, they're used for two different things. One of them is for the gods itself, and the second one is the method of worshipping those gods. And the third answer is given is that yes, it is a repeat. It is a repetitive sentence, but the reason why it is being repeated is to emphasize the message. It's to emphasize the message that Nabi Sallallahu is never ever going to change his method. And you guys are not going to change as well. You're going to continue worshipping the idols and you're going to continue doing shirk. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is never going, to continue, never going to change his method. He's only going to stick to Tawheed. So it's to emphasize the message. And also to that is that because you've got three opinions of the background of the story, maybe because they've come three different occasions, that's why it's been repeated to give them answers three times. So this is the reason why these ayats have been repeated. In the end, last verse, لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَدِينُ Again, deenukum, deenukum. So the word deen and deen has been repeated in this verse. So why is it repeated here? Hakimul Ummat Malana Shafari Tani Rahmatullah Alayhi says that lakum deenukum, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sallallahu alayhi wa is saying that for you is your religion and for you, for me is my religion. In this, both of them, the word deen is referring to the day of judgment. Meaning, you will see the consequences of your actions on that day. And I will see the consequences of my actions on that day. So for you is your actions, لَنَا عَمَالُنَا وَلَكُمْ عَمَالُكُمْ For me is my actions, for you is your actions. So this is what the Mawana Shavitani Rahmatullah is saying, is that the word deen here is referring to the day of judgment where you will see the result of your actions. In the second opinion, Imam Bukhari Rahmatullah is saying that لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ In the first one where Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that for you is your religion is, re, is, uh, is referring to kufr. That you have your kufr and you have your disbelief. Waliyadin, my deen is my Islam, and I will follow my religion, Dine Islam. So this is what Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi has said. So this is the background of this Surah Al Kafirun. Now, what are the lessons that we learn from this? There are quite a few lessons that we learn. Number one, first of all, is that we should only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is our creator, He is our Lord, He is our God. We do not worship anybody besides Him. And at the same time, what we also learn is that Tawheed. Tawheed, believing in one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very important. We do not associate partners with the being of Allah and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also. The being of Allah meaning idols. So we don't worship any idols, we don't worship any people. We only worship one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also in the attributes, we only worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nobody else. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gives shifa and he's, he's the one who gives cure. So yes, we may use the means around us, we may use the medication, we may use the treatments, we may go through the operation.
But we do not believe that these things are the ones that are going to cure us. We believe that behind that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the power, he's in control. If he has put the cure in that thing, that there will be cure. If he has not put the cure, he might be taking the same medication the second time. But because he has not placed a cure in the second time, we will not be cured. So what we have to believe in, even the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the one who gives shifa. Like this, he is the sole provider. He provides. Yes, we go to work, but that's the means. Now, for an example, in one of the Fajr Ta'alim, the Mutisa mentioned that you have a switch. Now, if I press the switch, that does not mean the switch is bringing the light. That's not making the tube light glow. There's a whole system behind it. There's a wiring behind it where it goes back to the electric power. So the switch is just the means of the connection where the electric current flow together and the connection is there and the brightness is there. That's not the main power source. That's not where the light is coming from. There are connections behind it. So this is just the means of the brightness on the tube light. Like this, when we go to work, when we take the medication, when we use the means available, they are just a switch to bring the power and bring what we need to, what we are trying to bring. So this is what we need to remember. This is one lesson that we learn that we only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another lesson that we learn is that there will be people within our community from different backgrounds, different faiths. We don't hurt them. We live with harmony. Yes, we have our limits. We don't cross them, cross them limits. We live, leave them in, leave, live with them in peace. Okay, we don't harm them in any way possible. In the story, in the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi time, during the battles, right, after migration, there were many battles that took place. Now, even though the battles were taking place one after the other, there was a time where there was a drought in Makatul Mukarramah, where the disbelievers were. There was a drought. The news reached Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, remember, this was the battle seasons. Now, imagine your enemy is going through difficulties and they're going through drought. What did Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do when he found out? He did chanda, he did a collection, and he sent that amount to Makatul Mukarramah. Not only sent it, he made sure that he reached Abu Sufyan, the leader of that time at that time, that made sure that he reached in his hand so he can help those people at that time. So imagine the tolerance that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. Even though they had dispute, they had, uh, uh, they had different uh, uh, belief and different faith, but Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he lived with harmony. So even in our country as well, in our place where we are people with other backgrounds, other faith, we should also tolerate and live with harmony and do not cause any harm. We do not get into any disputes with them as well. Another lesson that we learn, which is a very important one, is compromise. We don't compromise our deen for any worldly thing. Even though you may be given X amount of money, you may be given a free blank, you know, blank check, that just do this and compromise your deen, you are not ready to do that. We are not ready to do that. We cannot tolerate that. This is what the message has been given to us. Okay. Now, it's very sad to see and very sad to hear and very sad to witness that people who are believers, people who claim to be believers, people who came to believe, claim to believe in the kalima la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, but there are certain times of the year, there are certain times in their life where they sort of compromise their deen. Compromise their beliefs. It may not be directly, but indirectly they are. And one of them is in the month of December. You will see that in the month of December, there will be people who have good names, Muslim names. They may say that they pray the Jumu'ah Salah. They may say that we celebrate the month of Ramadan and we celebrate the days of Eid. But when it comes to this, the month of December, you will see that the activities that take place within Christianity and within other people those sort of activities have been creeping into our Muslims as well. And the sad, most sad thing is that they're doing openly. They're doing it on their social media where they are, you know, advertising what sort of decorations they have put into their homes, the trees that they have, the exact same pattern that their other people do from other faiths. You know, the gifts that they pack up, put it underneath a tree. And on the same day, they will gather together and you know, dress themselves up and you will have one you know, a, a, a person, an individual with the red and the white clothes, with the white beard coming, uh, you know, sharing the gifts out. So this is things are happening. Now this indirectly is compromising your belief of one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because their belief is about three in one and one in three and all of this is really is linked to that. 
Now, if a person is having, you know, doing such things, that means he's compromising his deen, he's compromising his belief with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is something that we need to realize and we need to keep ourselves from. This last thing, there's so much to talk about. One more thing that we're going to discuss are the virtues of this surah. So we mentioned at the beginning the translation. Number two, we went over the background of, the, uh, of this surah. Then number three, we went over the brief commentary of this surah. Number four, we went over a few of the lessons that we learned. And in the few of the lessons that we learned, let me just make mention of this as well, is that, as we mentioned, that we need to tolerate each other and we don't compromise our deen. Yes, there will be people from different madhabs. We have the four schools of thought, Maliki, Hanbali, Hanafi, and Shafi'i. They, in the practices of our deen, they may differ. They may pray the salah in a different way. They may have the zakah rulings different to ours. They may have the hajj. Uh, other, you know, rulings slightly different, but they're all linked back to Quran and Sunnah. So we all tolerate them as well. We accept them as well. So we don't take, talk ill about them as long as they're within the, you know, the four schools of thought where the, all of them are, you know, coming out of Quran and Sunnah. We t uh, tolerate with each other and look after each other. We don't dispute and we don't <coughs> disagree and co cause problems and disputes. And another thing that we also learn is that compromise in the practices of Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. This is also another important point. Unfortunately, this has also become very common. The Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and the direct ruling from the Quran is that when there are men and women, they should be separated. They don't mix together very freely. Now, there are certain events that are taking place. They may have very fancy Islamic name to it. But then when you look at the practices that they have in those events, there's no sort of veil between the men and women. There's no sort of hijab. They all sat together. They're all sitting together. And the person is do, do, you know, delivering his bayan. Now, I think Sahib also hinted towards this on Sunday Tafsir, this, uh, this Sunday Tafsir. And he said that, look, the person who's delivering the bayan, what is he trying to do? He's trying to make the servants connect themselves to Allah. Now, how can you make a person connect to Allah and at the same time disobey Allah? That doesn't make sense. He, then he gave an example. He gave an example that you've got the principle here. And I'm trying to tell one person here that, you know, you need to honor and respect this principle. But the words I use is that, O oh Abdullah, O oh Ahmad, we need to, you need to honor and respect this foolish principle here. O oh Abdullah, you need to respect this foolish Stupid, idiot, principle here. Now, will that make sense? Will it be correct? That I'm trying to give a lesson for him to respect the teacher and the principle, but I'm using insulting words. So there here, what is happening is that we are trying to deliver the message of connecting the servants to Allah, but then insulting the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the same time and violating the rights and the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it won't make the effect that you need to make. Then he said, okay, yes, chalo. That's for argument's sake. It does make a difference. The people do accept the message and they bring positive changes into their life. But then on the day of Jumla, Allah SWT is going to ask you the question, why did you break the law? The law of not following, you know, um, the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and the Quran clearly. So this is another thing that we need to be very careful of, that we don't just compromise, you know, here as well. Whatever the Quran and the sunnah and the Prophet Sallallahu life is that we should try to stick to that. Doesn't matter how beautiful people make it or how common it becomes, we need to try to stick to our principles and stick to our this life of the sunnah. Now just to conclude the few um, uh, virtues of this surah. Number one, one of the virtues of this surah is that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he read this surah Al-Kafirun and surah Al-Ikhlas in the sunnahs of Fajr Salah, in the sunnahs of Maghrib Salah, and also in the two rakahs of Tawaf, if a person has managed to go for Tawaf. So after Tawaf, the two rakahs that you pray. So in the first rakah, surah Al-Kafirun, and in the second case, Surah Al-Ikhlas. Okay, this is one practice of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number two, the second virtue of Nabi uh, mentioned in the hadith is that this Surah, Surah Al-Kafirun, is equal to one-fourth of the Qur'an. Is equal to one-fourth of the Qur'an, entire Qur'an, because of the message that he has. Number three, reading Surah Al-Kafirun before going to sleep. Reading Surah Al-Kafirun before going to sleep is protection from shirk. It's protection from shirk. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has you know, encouraged that before you go to sleep, you know, Alhamdulillah, we will have other adhkar that we do 
But make sure this is also included in there that we read Surah Al Kafirun, renunciation of shirk, and we, you know, making ourselves free from doing any shirk. And if you were to read Surah Al Kafirun in the morning, Fajr Sunnat, Surah Al Kafirun in Maghrib, again, we are beginning our day freeing ourselves from shirk and connecting ourselves to Surah Al Ikhlas, which is oneness of Allah. And we are ending our day freeing ourselves from shirk and claiming the, and connecting ourselves to Surah Al Tawheed. Uh, Surah Al-Ikhlas, which is the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And last virtue, which is alhamdulillah, inshallah, everybody will be interested in, is that we're living in a time of difficulty and crisis. The Jubair ibn Mu'tim radiallahu anhu came to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he said to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, mentioned to him that, you know, when you go on journey, uh, the Jubair ibn Mu'tim radiallahu anhu also uh, complained about difficulties in the journey and also not having enough, you know, provisions and defining a difficulty, and as we have, financially. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him that, look, I'm going to give you one wazifa. I'm going to give you one wazifa. And the wazifa is that whenever you go on a journey, if you want your journey to be complete and you want, you know, provisions in your journey and you want to have a successful journey, when you set off for your journey, do this amal. And the amal is very easy and very simple. Inshallah, we should also make the intention if you are not already doing it. And when you set off from your home on the journey, you recite, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Surah Al-Kafirun and end with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim again. Number two, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Surah Al-Nasr, Ida Ja'a Nasrullah wal-Fadh, you end with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim again. Number three, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Surah Al-Ikhlas, end with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim again. Number four, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Surah Al-Falaq, and you end with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And number five, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Surah Al-Nas, and end with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim again. So you're paying Bismillah at the beginning, paying Bismillah at the end, and five surahs in the middle. Surah Al-Kafirun, Al Surah Al-Nas, Surah Al which are next to each other. When you skip one surah, then you've got three surahs together. Surah Al-Ikhlas, Surah Al-Falaq, and Surah Al-Nas. So if you do this, then we will see the barakah of this in our journey. You know, those people who go to work, you will see the barakah in your work as well, and you will see barakah in all your provisions, inshallah. So this was the basic tafsir and the commentary of Surah Al-Kafirun. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to understand the Qur'an, give us the ability to implement the messages of the Qur'an. We also ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to free us from all types of shirk, protect us from all types of shirk, and give us strong iman and protect our iman, and give us the ability to practice upon the lessons that have been discussed and all the other Lessons that are supposed to be in this surah and in the rest of the surahs as well. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to practice upon what has been heard and what has been said. Jazakallah for your time. Subhanallah, bihamdi, subhanakallah, wa bihamdika. Nashidu la ilaha illa anta nasakhfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati ma yasifun. Wassalamun ala musaleen wa alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa rahmatika ya wa rahman rahimin.